Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Results may vary. It is a phrase that companies use all the time. The legal disclaimers make sure that everyone knows, even though there is an expected outcome, it's certainly not a promise. Results may vary. You might find it on the back of Oh, bottles of hair care products, weight loss supplements. You might hear it in commercials for the ladies of the greatest hair rejuvenation formula. Uh, you might find it at the end of instructions for super glue or carpet cleaners or maybe even pain or reduced medicine. Results may vary. In other words, we want this to happen, we think this is going to happen, and we have made sure that our product is going to produce this result, but depending on who uses it, and how it's used, and when it's used, and where it's used, we can't really guarantee that it's going to turn out like we want it to. So don't blame us if it doesn't work. Results may vary. And it can be frustrating to get it when you buy something and use something and count on something to work as advertised and it doesn't. Work for someone else, but it didn't work for you. Or it worked for you, but it did for someone else. Or it worked for you once, but it doesn't the next time. It's going to be exasperating when you can't count on the outcome because the results change all the time. Results may vary. The same phrase can be used when we're talking about the Holy Spirit working on the heart of someone through the Word of God. Results may vary. And that's not just true from observation. That's exactly what Jesus himself says in the Bible. He compares the Holy Spirit to wind. Because just as we cannot predict where the wind really is coming from or where it's going to go next, so we can't predict when and where and how the Holy Spirit is going to work in the hearts of someone through the Word of God. You've seen it in action. The same Word of God might be spoken by the same person at the same time in the same way to two different people. But there are not the same results. These people who could have lived in the same man, they could have been members of the same church, they could have been sitting in the exact same room but one person believed God's word and the other person didn't. Results may vary. We saw that in, in each of the three scripture readings today. When Jeremiah the prophet preached the word, some people believed it, some people didn't. The parable of the wedding man, some people believed God's word, some people didn't. Those stories in Acts chapter 8, some people believed God's word, but some people didn't. Some people were thrilled to hear the message about their Savior. Other people were appalled at the fact that they even needed to be saved. Results may vary. If you remember at the very beginning of that Acts chapter 8 reading, we came upon the aftermath for that brutal execution of Stephen. Now Stephen preached the word. He proclaimed the good news about Jesus as our Savior. And as a result, he was dragged outside of the city and he was stoned to death. A persecution against Christians spread throughout Jerusalem that day so that anyone who believed that Jesus as their Savior was in danger of being arrested and thrown in jail and possibly even facing death themselves. But at the exact same time, in a different place, with different people, the Word of God had the complete opposite effect. Here's part of that story from Acts chapter 8 again. Those who had been scattered preached the Word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. 
with shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Yeah, who would have guessed? Who would have ever imagined that the Jewish people, God's chosen nation, in the capital city of the Promised Land, who had the written word of God for 1,500 years, would reject God's word and the Savior that fulfilled all those promises. But then when Philip traveled north and crossed the border from Judea into Samaria, and he started preaching that exact same word of God to people who weren't even on speaking terms with the Jewish people of Jerusalem, they receded with joy. In fact, the Bible says that that great joy filled the city as they listened to Philip preach and watched the miracles that were being performed. Results may vary. And then we have that incredible story about Simon the Sorcerer. Here's that part of the story about Simon. Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and explained, This man is the divine power, known as the great power. They followed him, because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Now Simon was a gay-list celebrity in Samaria. He had not only built up for himself an impressive following from all walks of life by what we would call black magic, but he was also known and called the Great Power. <laughs> And this guy had it all. He was, he was an influential cult leader in Samaria. And everyone from young to old, from rich to poor, and everyone in between revered him. But then when he heard Philip preach the good news about Jesus and the forgiveness of sins through faith in him, even Simon the sorcerer believed and was baptized. Results may do. Why is that? Why does that happen? How could the Jewish nation by and large reject the Lord, but then Samaritans accept Him? How could the Jewish leaders drag Stephen outside of the city walls of Estonia, but a guy like Simon the sorcerer believe? How can so many people today turn their backs on God's Word and their Savior? But other people hold that to be true until they're dying. What's the difference? What is the catalyst that pushes one person one way and another person another? It's a question that has been debated for millennia. And so some people come up with the idea that the difference must be in God. It must be God who chooses beforehand that he wants to save someone and also chooses beforehand that he is going to condemn someone. And that's somewhat logical, but it's not biblical. Because God himself says that he wants everyone to be saved. He wants everyone to know him as their Savior. He wants everyone to be with him in heaven. And so he is not going to choose beforehand to condemn someone before they're ever born, even if that is where they eventually end up. And so the opposite extreme, people come up with the idea that it must be us. The difference must be people. That maybe some of us are simply more inclined to believe than other people. Maybe some of us are, are more prone to listen to the Lord's message than other people. Maybe it's up to us to decide whether we want to believe in Jesus or not. That again is 
somewhat logical, but it's not biblical. Because God says that every one of us, by nature, is dead in sin. Spiritual corpses, unable to choose Him, incapable of accepting His invitation, powerless to welcome Him into our hearts on our own. God must do the work. The Holy Spirit has to work in our de decaying and decomposing hearts and make us alive by giving us the gift of faith of Jesus as our Savior. God must do the work. We can't do anything. And so that age-old question, why are some saved and not others, is really two different questions. And each has its own answer. Why are some saved? By God's grace, through faith in Jesus. Why are others not saved? Because they have rejected the Lord and His Word. Which means those who do not end up in heaven, they can only blame themselves. But for those of us who do end up in heaven, God gets all the credit. And that's our comfort. God's grace expressed to us in incredible acts of love through Jesus on the cross gives us the comfort and the confidence to know that when we die, we will go to heaven. Because even though results may vary in this world, the results do not vary with you because God's promises never do. God's promises never vary. God's promises never change. God's promises to you always come true. God promises that long before you were ever born, He decided that He was going to send His own Son down into the sinful world so that He could take the form of a human body and live among us. God promises that Jesus' life on this earth wasn't just a practice for and it wasn't just a safari through a sinful landscape so that he could kind of see what it's like and then leave. Now Jesus' life on this earth was supposed to be in our place as our substitute. God promises that when Jesus kept his Father's laws perfectly, it's as if you did. And when Jesus followed every one of his Father's directions perfectly, it's as if you did. And when Jesus listened to every one of his Father's words perfectly, it's as if you did. God promises that when Jesus was rejected at the end of his life, and when he was tortured, and when he was finally executed, it wasn't just a tragic ending to an innocent man's life meant to elicit an emotional response. Well, this was the ultimate and final payment for everything that we have ever done wrong and everything I've ever done wrong. God promises that despite what this world says, Jesus actually did rise from the dead. God promises that despite what this world thinks, Jesus actually appeared to hundreds of different people after he rose from the dead to prove that it was true. God promises that despite what this world claims, Jesus actually lifted up off the ground and went back into heaven where he sits on his throne and rules all things for all time, waiting until he comes back again. God promises that because you believe in Jesus as your Savior, you are forgiven. Everything you've ever done and everything you've failed in. Everything you've ever said and every time you should have said something but you didn't. Every thought, every feeling, every emotion, every attitude that was unbecoming of a Christian. Any way that you have never got to the standard that the Lord himself has set, all of that has been taken off of your heart and placed on your Savior. God promised. 
And God promises that because you are forgiven, you will go to heaven. One day you will be with Jesus in his perfect home. Because although results may vary in this world, with God's word working on people's hearts, they do not vary with you. Because God's promises don't. That's the message Philip preached. And the Samaritans believed. It's the message that Philip took with him wherever he went. The message that Simon the sorcerer even held to be true. But it's also the message that got Stephen killed. It was the message that scattered the church. It was a message that Saul was trying to destroy before he became the apostle Paul. It's a message that is still rejected today by millions of people throughout this world. Results may vary. Results do vary. <coughs> but that's not our concern. But we don't know when God will work in the hearts of people through His Word. We don't know where God will work in the hearts of people through His Word. But we do know that He will. He will work when and where He wills. The results are not in our hands. The results are in His. And isn't that nice to know? That there's no pressure on us to convince a heart. There's no pressure on us to try to argue them into God's family. There is no pressure on us to do the actual work God does. He simply asks us to go. <coughs> and that is exactly what we've been focusing on these past three weeks and in our Sunday morning Bible studies. Go. We go because there is an urgency to that command. We go because it is such an incredible, incredible privilege for us to do so. And we go with the confidence that the results are squarely in the arena of the Lord's job description. It's exciting, isn't it? It's exhilarating to have a chance to share with someone the Word of God. To have an opportunity to introduce someone to their Savior for the very first time, even though the results may vary. Some people will believe God's word, some people won't. Some people won't give it a second thought. Some people can't stop thinking about it. Some people want nothing to do with Jesus. Other people want everything to do with Him. Results may vary. But that's okay. Because God's promises 